Rock stars, welcome. It's March the 29th. This is day two of the five day guitar challenge boot camp, right? This is supplementing, supporting all the folks that got in this weekend into the program and just helping whoever needs help with the guitar here. I wanted to take, you know, we did this 30 day challenge a couple years ago during the lockdown and everybody was at home and we talked about doing it again because everybody had such a good time and um, it was like camp or something. It was really quite a moment. But, you know, times were different and we were locked down. So it was like, it kind of made sense that, that we were all there for that, uh, for those 30 days. So we decided to not do 30 days, but we're doing this five days. We're packing in what we did in 30 days into five. Obviously, it's a truncated version of it, but, um, but that's what we're doing. And so if you're watching on YouTube, a couple things real quick. The very first link below will bring you to the page that you can get the course that we talked about yesterday and that we're talking about today. And you get it for free. It's the Unstoppable Guitar System Standard. And we're also giving you another course, the one that we dropped this weekend. Um, check that out. It was how to play chord scales, licks, solos all over the neck. It's uh, maybe a six something like six video course. So we're giving both of those to you. Those are, those are available to you. Clicking on that link in the description of the video to bring you to uh, a sales page, what we call a sales page, where you can, if you want to get into the program, you can buy it. If you don't want to, that's okay. Uh, we like to call it a free page. We call it whatever we want to call it. But that's where everything's at. The free stuff, if you want to get into the course, you can do that. And right now we do have a special going on. Let me tell you about it really quick. And then we're going to get into the lesson. Uh, the normal, you know, uh, unstoppable guitar system is 685. Right now it's $222 off. Uh, and that'll be good until Sunday. We also have yearly specials. So normally if you, if you're paying monthly with UGS, it's 19 bucks a month, comes out to like 228 bucks in a year. If you buy the yearly, it's 180, but we're knocking 30 bucks off of that. So it's literally 150 to get in for an entire year. A bunch of folks are signing up with that one. Um, so jump in there. Uh, even a lot of our monthly folks are jumping in there. Okay. So do that. And, um, what, what else? 365, normally 79 bucks. It's 49 bucks today. You can find all that by clicking that link. Okay. Now I'm assuming that if you have not done it already, you're doing it right now. You're going to that link and you're getting the, the two programs I'm giving you today. Cause today is this part two where we're going to be looking at the beginner section of guitar and specifically I'm in the beginner section of this course that I'm giving you, okay? And for everybody that missed yesterday, mm. they can watch the replay on that page. That's right. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Okay. So on that page, uh, the one that's in the link or in the description of the video, if you click on that, you'll be able to watch yesterday's broadcast. And since we're doing five of these and they are in sequential order, you'll be able to have access to all of them. Cool. Awesome. Here we go. Here are the things that we're talking about today. We're going to answer the question. You're going to answer the question. Why do you want to play guitar? I'm going to let you know why that's so important. We're going to do a basic study in rhythm. We're going to do strumming approaches, like how to, how to, how to strum the guitar, but strumming approaches. So I'm giving you some tips that are going to get you where you want to get to. A word about guitar picks, all sorts of words about guitar picks. Developing ninja-like chord technique with a method I'm going to show you. Also the curled knuckle technique. Nine essential chords. All about capos and how to transpose using them. Uh, chord transitions, inventory trick uh, that has to do with moving from one chord to the next using, uh, using some tricks. What I call the inventory trick. It will help a ton. Okay. Also, uh, introduction to the major scale because it's literally the backbone, the, yes, yeah, the backbone. It's like the ruler. If we were a, if we were a carpenter, it's the ruler. It's the slide rule. If you're, I don't know, into whatever math you need slide rules for. I took algebra five times in college. I didn't have time for other math. Uh, so introduction to the major scale, right? And then playing by ear. We're going to talk about all that stuff today. Okay. So here we go. Uh, anything else to tell the, the fine kids? I don't think so. I think that's it for right now. Here we go. We're jumping into this now. Uh, friends, 
here you go. If you look at my screen, if or when we get this together here, um, let's see, what are we working on? What, the why, the why, the why, the why. So let's look at this, okay? So check this out. Uh, another way you could do this, in, if, if you're inside the Unstoppable Guitar System, which anybody who's watching this should be, because I'm giving it to you for free by hitting that link. So you guys know this is all familiar, right? I'm talking to the one guy who's like, ah, I'm scared. And I'm like, yeah, I'm giving you the course for free. Get in there, man. Um, so, you know, one way that you could do this is you can just scroll and we can find our why it is that we want to play guitar. Maybe we'll do that. But another, way, another thing you can do inside the system here is you can click right up here and you can search for whatever you want. Like if we wanted to say why, you could do that. And then bingo, bango, here you go. Why do you want to play the guitar? So I can do that and I can search. So if you're looking for bar chords or blues or something like that inside the system, that's a great way to find out what you want real quick, okay? So why do you want to play the guitar? That's where I'm at in the program here. So you definitely want to, um, you definitely want to check that out. And where did I put that? Eh, I think it's in maybe like the, the module two here or something. But nonetheless, okay, that's what I'm looking at. That's where you're gonna... Module one. I'm in module one? I sure am, aren't I, Mike? I don't even see the name. Where is it? Scroll up. Oh. Uh, below your video. That'll tell you where you are. Keep going up. Keep going up. See right there, right above the video. Well, I know that, no, 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 I know that. Yeah, I was looking for something. I was looking for in the list here, on the side here, where am I? But I don't know. Down Got so many daggone videos in here. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's on this next page here. Anyhow, there's different. There's multiple ways that you can navigate this site, and everybody's going to kind of find their own thing uh, that works best for them. Okay, here we go. Somewhere around here. Why do you want to play the guitar? There it is. Okay. All right. Good. Good. All right. So. <clears throat> A lot of folks that don't get it will watch me and they'll say, why would you spend the time doing that? Why don't you show us something to play? Listen, I got thousands of videos where I show you how to play stuff. Thousands of videos, like somewhere in the neighborhood of like 3,000 now, okay? So I have plenty of videos where I show you how to play. But this question of why do you wanna play the guitar is the most important question that you can ask as a guitar player, as a musician, you know, if you're a saxophonist, you can ask the same thing. Why is it that you wanna do that? And typically the people that don't get it are also the types of people that don't see the success because they don't do the thing that it takes to get the, su the success. So asking this question, why, it is, why do you want to play guitar is really important because one person is going to say, well, because it just really calms me down. It makes me happy. Okay, cool. That's, that's awesome. It's a great reason. And that might be the only reason. And somebody else might say, man, because I play worship guitar at church and I want to worship God and I want to do it with my guitar. Okay, cool. That's a different set of skills needed. And then somebody else is here. They go, man, every Tuesday night at my uh, local VFW, they do blues night. And so everybody shows up there and we, we have a great time and I want to be good at that. Okay, awesome. Different, different needs there. But see, answering this question as to why it is that you want to play guitar is going to take the 10 million videos on YouTube that talk about, you need to know this and you need to know that. I have some of those. Not making fun of anybody, but you have all of these videos and all these places you could go, right? We live in a time now where information is not at a lack, right? Neither is misinformation. There's tons of craziness out there, right? So in order to find out what it is that you need to do on the guitar, you need to pinpoint what it is that, where it is that you want to go and then find the things that are associated with that. So for instance, if you're a blues guitar player, studying the jazz modes is probably not going to move the blues needle for you, okay? It's not going to make you much of a better blues player, okay? Unless you're doing blues jazz, but I'm talking of blues, okay? Blues players aren't cycling through all the modes, okay? So that would be something that you could say, I'll learn that later, I'm interested in it, but to be a blues player is not what I want to do. Learn your blues scales, all forms of them. Learn a bunch of blues licks. Learn how to play sevenths and ninth chords, right? So take, taking your chords and creating those seventh and ninth iterations, that's the sort of thing you'd want to do as a blues guitar player, you know, as a, as a 
Um, campfire guitar player, you'd want to know all your open chords, you'd want to know how to use your capo. A lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about today, actually, you would want to know how to transpose with that capo, you'd want to know how to strum correctly. These are all things we're talking about today. So, um, so you so understand. So, the, your homework is to write this down right now. Seriously, do it. The pen's right there. Pick that up, write it down, say, Why do I want to play guitar? And when this is done, when this broadcast is done, I want you to take the time and the more detailed you are about it, the more direction you're going to have, meaning the more stuff you could cut out that you won't need to learn right now. Okay. It's going to get you to the place that you want to get to much quicker. So do that when you're done here. If you don't do that, do you know why it is that you're doing what you're doing? And then you're going to think, oh, I need this video and that video and watch. I mean, there's questions all the time that pop up in the chat. I can tell somebody didn't ask this question because they're like, Man, do you think that learning the jazz modes are more important than learning the three finger scales or do you think the cage system is more important, right? And I say, well, what do you want to do? And they're like, well, I love punk music. Okay, you don't need any of those, <laughs> okay? You don't need the cage system really for punk. You're not gonna need, um, I forgot what the other two I mentioned. Nonetheless, it's real simple. Punk is very simple. So understanding what it is that you wanna do is gonna help you determine what it is that you need, okay? So, so that's why it's the most important question. Um, okay, today we're gonna talk about a basic study in rhythm. Again, I'm walking folks through who've just joined the program here. So some of this may be elementary to, to some and to others it's gonna be brand new. I always know when someone's ego's involved and they're poor in spirit when they make fun of, of new lessons, of beginner lessons like that the whole world was learning guitar the day they started to learn guitar. And when I see these comments, I go, ah, it's too bad for that person because they don't have, the, they're poor in spirit. They don't understand that they're a complete fool in front of the whole internet saying that something is, who doesn't know that already? Well, Jack, you just learned it. You know, I tell you who ha doesn't learn it, who doesn't know it yet is the guy who's 10 years younger than you and is just picking up the guitar. That's the guy who doesn't know it. So everybody is on this continuum, right? We're all learning these things, but Every single, the, every single one of these things that I'm teaching you guys is really important stuff. It's just foundational. There's no guitar player on earth who's not using this stuff. It's that foundational, okay? So basic study in rhythms. It's good to know, to understand how rhythms work, okay? So, you know, even the most unschooled or unexposed uh, underexposed to music person there is when music starts you almost will see somebody start bobbing their head right or tapping their hand or stomping their foot or something because it's infectious there's a groove going it's predictable unless you're listening to something that's polyrhythms or something you know and then that can be interesting to listen to but 99.9 .9 percent of the music out there is a straight straight beat and we can move with it and there's something about patterns that attract us right there's something about symmetrical faces there's something about a story where it crescendos into this oh no the villain's going to take over and no good wins in the end because it does right we're used to these things if you go to a disney movie and the villain wins in the end you're, you, you'll want your money back. You'll be like, that's outside the pattern. So there's all these patterns that, we've, that we're constantly attracted to, whether we know it or not. And symmetry is one of those. So music is full of symmetry. It's full of patterns. And so understanding how the beats work is one step, one segment in our little clock there of the things that we need to know in order to be a great musician. And so... Uh, we're listening to a song, we're tapping our foot, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, right, one. And songs, for the most part, are in four or in three, or some, some division of those, eight or six, you know. But nonetheless, four and three are the most common signatures and keep what we call um, time signatures, and they are probably 99% of the songs that are out there. And the other 1% are gonna be polyrhythmic type songs like something in seven or nine or five or something like that, okay? Um, See Money by 
Pink Floyd. That was like the only hit song in the history of ever that is in seven. Pretty, pretty cool. Uh, or it has segments in it that are in seven. I think it has segments in it that are in, that are, uh, that are in four or eight, but a lot of it is in seven. So, uh, so, so we need to understand these rhythms, these basic rhythms, okay? So when we're tapping our foot, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Well, you know, notice that when we count usually with music, a song, if a song's in four, we count four. That's because we're dividing up a measure. A measure of music is kind of like a sentence, except it's, not, it's, it's, it's more defined by time, okay? So if we have a metronome clicking at 60 beats per minute, that means it's clicking on the second. So right with a clock, okay? And so in that case here, if it's 60 beats per minute, I tap 60 steps in a minute or, or beats, okay? And then we'd have four of those in a measure. So, so we have something to start quantifying and bringing the music to a place where we can start defining it and, and, be, and it can be predictable, right? So that everybody in the band can be working together, talking the same language. So you got four beats in a measure, two, three, four, and the measure starts over again. So we call, since there's four of these in a measure, we call them quarter notes, okay? Four quarters that make up that whole measure. If we just stomped our foot on the one or clapped on the one and held it out for four beats, that would be a whole measure because, or it would be a whole note because it takes the whole measure, okay? So for instance, um, or really a whole, a whole note is known as four beats, okay? So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. More accurately, if we play on an instrument because it needs to sustain for that long. So we said one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Those are whole notes, right? Because it's the whole measure. Half notes, obviously, would be if we cut that in half. So it'd be every two. So it'd be like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Makes sense. It's cut in half. Quarters would be cutting that, right? Cutting that, that hole into quarters. So four of them. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Usually played on the downstroke when our foot hits the ground. Down beat, down stroke. Okay, we'll be looking at that and strumming a little bit later. When our foot comes up, that's called an up beat. Okay. And it's also called an up strum because our hand's coming up. So we said one and two and three and four and one and two and three. Those are eighth notes because now we have eight of those in a measure, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. And of course, if we double that, we would have sixteenths. Then uh, we have something, the, the last thing I'm going to show you today is called the triplet. And basically, that's where instead of two or four, we put three in a measure. And it sounds a little bit more disjunct. But if we were counting like this, two, three, four, or it could be three in a measure. It could be three in a beat. In this case, I'll do three in a beat. So if, if our beat is one, two, three, four, a triplet would be... Triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it, right? So three, instead of the real even two, we got, okay? That's called a triplet. Uh, more detail inside the course that you guys are getting for free today, clicking on that link, will take you there, okay? Okay, so we have a basic study in rhythm. Now, we're gonna talk about strumming a bit here. And strumming, uh, we did this in the right order because uh, it's all based off of quarter notes and eighth notes, okay? Now, because we're gonna be strumming the guitar for the rest of our lives, it's kind of important, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. If you answered yes, then you're correct. It is important because we have to attack the strings in some way and a lot of times we're strumming. So, um, Let's do this. Um, all right, so if we're, here's what I want you to do to, to get ready for strumming. Take your left hand, put it on the strings as light as a feather, like 
this is a, you know, a, a, a dry sponge, okay? It's the only analogy I got. A dry sponge, just so it creates that percussive sound instead of, we don't want that, that's distracting. That's what we want. And then what I want you to do is on the downbeat, two, three, four, you're just hitting your strings, right? That's downbeats, down strums. If we come up, so right now we're passing by the strings, but we're not hitting the strings on the way up. So you already have this control built in. If we hit it on the way up too, we're hitting the, the upbeats or the up strums. So we have and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four. And three. Make sense? Now, if we take out one of the ands in this strumming bit, it's not so daunting, it's not so troubling, but if we leave out one of the downbeats, it can be a little bit troubling and, and, and there's some tricks to get over that. Let's start with the easy one first, is the up strum, okay? So check this out. Let's say I wanna count, I wanna strum uh, one and two, uh, one and two and three and four, but the and, I don't wanna hit the strings. I want it to be silent. Okay, what I need to do in order to stay in tandem with the downbeat and the down strum, with the upbeat and the up strum, I need to keep moving my hand. Otherwise, if I stall, the beat keeps going and then my hand's down here and now all of a sudden we're, we're flipped, right? So uh, my foot's coming down, my hand's coming down, so it'd be like one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Okay, and I'm whispering that to kind of give you that indication that you don't want to hit the strings there. And this is a great way to practice. So if you're ever having problems with strumming, this you just need to break it down to this. What the problem is, is that most people don't realize they need to do that. And or if they realize they need to do that, they want it to happen faster. And there's not a way for that to happen faster. You have to go through the routine. Your brain has to get it. So you gotta go through it, okay? It's like anything, it's like any gauntlet, right? So here we go, one and two and three and four and, and so my hand comes up, one and two and three and four and, one and two and three and four and, two and three and four and, one and two and three and four and. And then what you do is you slowly speed it up to where that starts feeling more comfortable. Now, um, all of these and a lot more exercises are inside the strumming video, which was right after, um, well, it's in, it's in the core of what you guys are getting today, okay, that course. Now, um, now if, if the up, if the down strum is blank, what we call ghost, like there's nothing there, strumming wise, then that becomes a little bit more difficult because for whatever reason, this is one of the things that I discovered with my students over thousands and thousands of lessons, I was like, wow, they get, they, they can leave the out, the downbeat, or they can leave the upbeat out, but the downbeat, when they leave that out, that messes them up. And I found that to be consistent, right? Not every time, but if they were gonna mess up on something, it was the downbeat or the down strum. So, I found a way to get around that. I'm gonna show, share it with you and it's super helpful. Okay, so check this out. So when we're doing this, if we go, let's say we leave the four out. Let's say we go one and two and three and four and, okay? Try this by yourself right now. One and two and three and and. So on the four, you can say it, you can do whatever you need to do but whisper it, whatever, to know that you don't strike the string. So here we go, it's gonna go one and two and three and four and, okay? Now, let's do it together for just a minute if you think you got it, right? Here we go. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and, and one and two and three and, and one and two and three and, and one and two and three and, now, if you couldn't play that with me just now, it means you don't have it, that's okay, because we all have to learn this stuff. But what that means is you need a reason to bring your hand down here, because for whatever reason, 
it's like this mental thing if we're not doing something. So I found that if I tap my thigh or tap the bottom of my guitar, it's like this totem. It's a thing that I'm doing and my hand will go down there. You only have to do that for like the first, I don't know, two, 10 times, something like that first few times in order for it to start sinking in the, and then eventually you can wean yourself away from doing that. So for instance, this is what I mean by that. So I would go one and two and three and, and I'm hitting my thigh and then bringing my hand up. One and two and three and boom. And one and two and three and boom, right? And then eventually you could hit your guitar. One and two and three and and one and and what it does is it gives you mentally gives you a reason a goal to come down here so that you're ready for the up strum okay anybody who i've walked i've helped them with their strumming using that method right there because some some people are scratching their heads like i don't get it that's fine if you don't get it it's a very very simple concept that people skip over and because of that they have problems strumming if, if i've helped you with your strumming in that way with that particular thing, right strum right now and a big smiley face or something like that. So folks know that it's in snake oil, it's daggone, it's principles, it's foundationals, okay? It's important, very important. I just saw we got a donation, whoever did that, thank you so much. Very kind. It's nitro. 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 Nitro, nitro, not nitro. <laughs> nitro. Thank you, Nitro. Super kind. All right. Um, weird. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay. We did a basic study on rhythms. Okay. Strumming. We just did some strumming approaches, right? Uh, there's a lot more detail, obviously, inside of the, the program there for you. Okay. I really want to get to your questions, so I'm going to try to crank through all this. Let's talk about picks for a minute, man, because picks are really important. Over the years, I've accumulated hundreds of picks of all different material, of all different thickness, thinness, sizes, shapes, just everything. I've got the weirdest picks. I've got metal picks, I've got stone picks, I've got wood picks, I've got picks made of guitar strings, I have um, just all. Anyhow, when it comes to, to picks, here's what I'll tell you. There's a few rules of thumb and then there's personal choice. Let's talk about the rules of thumb first because that's gonna cover everybody. The thicker the pick, the more accurate the picking will be. Makes sense, right? Because it's, it's rigid, so it doesn't have a lot of give, okay? That would be good for intricate picking, like soloing, that sort of thing. But even then, as a new guitar player, you probably aren't going to gravitate towards a very thick pick like a, like a heavy. You're probably going to gravitate more towards a medium or lighter. As a rule of thumb, okay? Uh, that being said, the more skilled you get with a pick, then the more control you have. And just like anything else, uh, the less forgiving it needs to be because now you're wasting movement, right? And then in those cases, your technique will be up and you'll be able to use a thicker pick. One is not better than the other. It's literally what makes you feel better, what sounds better to you. It's all personal choice. There is no right. Anybody saying that a thicker pick is better than a thinner pick just shows you that they're um, not very intelligent or they're just dead set on their opinion. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, okay? I bet you if you found out tomorrow Stevie Ray Vaughan was playing thin picks or whatever, I bet you he wasn't because he was such a heavy player, but, but the deal is, is that you'll find out, well, Billy Gibbons plays sevens on his strings, you know, and Billy Gibbons is a fine guitar player. We talked about that yesterday. So don't get caught up in all like what this guy uses or what that gal uses. It doesn't matter what they use. It matters what you use and what you desire, okay? And that, that is true. I don't just say that. It's, it's just true. So when you're doing big types of strumming, you want a thinner pick. And they have them that have grip on them and that sort of thing. But you want a thinner pick because you want it to, to give with you because you're pushing through six strings, right? And then coming back up, pushing through six strings. So, uh, but when you're picking individually, you need it to be more stable. So you typically a thicker pick. 
So think of your strumming, thinner picks are gonna probably feel better, but do your experimenting. And when you're playing individual notes, a thicker pick will usually feel better, but again, do your experimenting. And do your experimenting anyhow, this is the second part of, of picks here. Go out, go to the store, buy a bunch of different assorted picks. Because you don't know what you want, it's kind of like going to a smorgasbord and taking a little bit of everything. That's what I would always do. I don't go to smorgasbords anymore because the, the food quality is terrible for the most part. But um, I used to love smorgasbords. And I would go up and I'd get one little tiny dab of everything. And then I'd sit down and I'd be like, I'd taste everything. And I'm like, those three things. And I'd go up and get whatever I wanted. And that's what you'll do with picks, right? So you get a little bit of everything. And then you try those things out. And then you say, dude, this is my favorite pick. So this right here is my, is my favorite pick. It's been for years now. And it's the, it, as far as like an affordable go-to pick for everything, especially electric work, which I've been doing just more lately, uh, I, these Dunlop Ultex, U-L-T-E-X, U-L-T-E-X. And I'm using a 0.88, 0.88. So it's almost a full millimeter. Uh, it's thick enough to where it doesn't really give that much, but if I need to strum through at least electrically and stuff like that, I don't feel like I'm just murdering the strings. And also I find with a much thicker pick, so if I went thicker than this, what I find is the tone starts becoming darker again. So the, a thinner pick creates a, a brighter tone. Makes sense, right? Because you're, you're hitting it with something lighter. Uh, and so, uh, the, the, the thicker picks, I just don't like the, the darkness, that the dark sounds that they create. So when they start getting too thick, it just loses its life to me. I don't feel like I have this uh, relationship with, this, with the picks, with, with the strings. There's too much pick in between us or something. You know? So I don't, I don't personally like that. There's tons of players that love really thick picks. So go with what works best for you. Cool? All right, great stuff. All right, so let's, let's move on to developing ninja light chord technique. Okay, so we talked about the, yesterday we talked about the fretting technique, right? And that is absolutely crucial that we understand how to fret the instrument properly from a single note perspective before ever looking at a chord. Because I don't know about you, but when I started juggling as a kid, I didn't start with five balls, I started with two, okay? And then eventually you put a third one in the air and you kind of start getting used to that and then so on and so forth, okay? So we're getting used to one thing at a time here. That's gonna make sense because then we're taking that same uh, concept and we're doing it you know, three or four times across the fretboard. Makes sense that we get the first one down first, right? Okay, so now when we're talking about cording, a couple of very important things here. What I say, um, ninja-like chord technique with this method is there's a few different things that I'm thinking about when doing this, okay? There's curling my knuckle, there's dropping my thumb behind the back of the neck, playing on my fingertips, playing close to the frets, all the things that we talked, or many of those things we talked about in fretting. Let's review. As far as fretting, single notes, we want to be close to the fret. We don't want to be back here because what happens if we're back here, creates that sound. And if we're too far this way on the fret, it starts muting. Right? So what we want, this is the ideal place is right behind that fret. Okay, exactly behind that fret. Now, at first, if you're a little bit more observant, anal, Whatever you want to say about it, you're, you're just like hell bent on getting the right technique. That's good to do in the beginning. Later on, you won't have to think like that, but you gotta think like that at first, okay? You're close up to this fret. You're also playing on your fingertip. Again, what I did yesterday is I took this pen and I said, well, let's take these little dots and put them on our fingertip here. So when I'm playing my chord, or, and that one's a little bit on the pad there, so I won't count that one. When I'm looking at the, this, it should be on my fingertips, not on the pads of my fingers. This is the pad right here. That's the pad of my finger. This is the tip of my finger, okay? Make sense? Don't want to be hitting that part. You want to be hitting this part for the most part. Now, 
right behind the fret. I'm playing on the tip of my finger, my thumbs behind the back of the neck, and it's also right there behind that first finger. Does that make sense? So if my first finger's here, my thumb's right there. If my second finger comes down, my thumb moves. You can't, might not see it that much, but it's moving with it uh, linearly this way. So I put this third finger down, my thumb moved with it. If I do my first finger, my thumb moved over here behind the, behind the back of the neck, right? So like that. Uh, so we got those basic techniques down as far as fretting the guitar, close to the fret, fingertips, um, press down with a sufficient amount of pressure that you can get a good tone out of the guitar. Not a, not a buzz. We don't. We're not looking for that. We're looking for this. Okay. So once we have that down, to get a proper chord technique, we really have to have this thumb coming down because we need the slack of our hand to be out front so that we can curl those knuckles so that we have lots of room right in between here, okay? We don't wanna do this. Yes, I know the pros do that. I do it all the time as well because I've gotten used to the guitar and I can play my chords still like this, but in the beginning, I, I couldn't. Nobody can in the beginning. So you wanna drop that thumb back here and give yourself the advantage of proper technique, okay? Now, once we do that, we wanna curl this last knuckle. So a lot of teachers will, will say, drop the shoulder, um, you know, play in the classical stance like this, uh, all of these different things. And those things are all helpful, but ultimately what they're leading to is they're leading to creating some clearance. Ultimately, that's what the, all of the, the tricks are trying to do is to create clearance right in here in between the, the strings and, and the neck. Make sense? And so one way that we can do that, and the easiest way I've found, is to curl this knuckle. So if you take your hand and you just do that right there, you know, like you were going to break a board, curling that knuckle there will prove to you that you can curl that knuckle pretty pretty severely. So then when you're coming back to the guitar here, what you want to do is you want to think that, curling that knuckle, because now that feels extreme. You'll feel a little bit of fatigue in the hand because you're doing something that's just not usual, but that's the kind of perfect scenario. If you could create that perfect scenario, you'd be curling that, that knuckle, but eventually you're going to lighten up and you're going to find what the quan is, what how much you actually need to curl that knuckle before it becomes uncomfortable or before you start muting out the chord. If I'm not curling that knuckle, I'm not gonna get that, that, that tone, right? I'm not gonna get the... Um, I'm not gonna get the, the chord sounding without buzzing, okay? All right, so that's what you wanna do with literally every single chord. And you wanna do it one, one note at a time. So if I was building this chord, I might build it from the, the high E, you know. Then I bring in this, this other finger. Uh-oh, I got a mute there. So now I can concentrate on that, curl that knuckle, instead of being like, well, the whole chord sucks. It's like the whole chord doesn't suck. You just got that one little guy there that you need to fix, right? And then moving on to the fifth string. You just, you know, basically want to build the chord so that you can hyper-focus on each one of the, the little bits that you're looking at there and determine which finger is being muted and why, okay? But the curl uh, curled knuckle technique is going to get you there pretty quickly. All right, uh, th th three more things. Four more things. I have eight here twice. Four more things. Uh, okay, the nine essential chords. I'm just going to talk about them. I'm not going to show you how to play them because you have the course. I'm just going to go through them really quickly. Nine essential chords are the nine chords that if you know these chords, you can play millions of songs. Okay? They're the most important chords that you would need to know. And here they go. So G, A, a minor, C, D, D minor, E, E minor, 
You see that six, seven, eight, uh, and then nine would be the B7. Okay, easy enough. So you have so A A major, A minor, D major, D minor, E major, E minor, G, C, and B7. Okay, those are the nine. They're in the course. Um, I think that's nine. Yeah, sure it is. Now you know those, and then you would literally be able to use your capo, as we're going to see here in a minute, and that's going to be able to, that would allow you to play all these different songs. Okay, like I teach. I mean, like literally on YouTube for years. That's all. That's all I was teaching folks was these basic songs. Uh, I mean, I knew a lot more, but you, everybody seemed to love that stuff. Um, I was really into the acoustic guitar very much, like singer songwriter type stuff back then. So, um, so I was like. This is a perfect fit. So that's what I did. I just made a bunch of those videos because people love them. So, um, but learning how to use your capo and you, knowing those nine essential chords, knowing some basic rhythms, uh, basic strums, everything which is in this free course that I'm giving you right now, first link in the description of the video, uh, follow that. Once you go to that page, go all the way to the bottom to sign up and I'll give you those two courses for free. Um, all that stuff is covered in here. Cool? And it's free. Uh, okay, all about capos and how to transpose using them. Okay, yes, so this is called the capo. Some people call it a capo. Some people call it guitar clip. And um, whatever you want to call it, this is what it does. It presses the strings down, okay? Why would we want to do that? Well, because right here, if I strum the guitar like this, the strings are ringing out right here in the open position. And we can play chords, we can play our nine essential chords, but what happens if we wanted that song to be in a different key, but we didn't want to change our fingerings where we had to, had to, had to create the chords. So we have a chord a progression that's in, that's in G and it's like a G, C, D. Well, if I wanted to do that in the key of A, the only thing I would have to do is say G, which we're in the key of G, go up two half steps, G sharp, A, and now if I play that same exact chord progression, I'm gonna have the key of A. And I'm gonna use a different capo, because this one's pressing my strings down, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, we're talking about different types of capos and why you would wanna have a different type of capo like this, okay? So, so now I'm playing what still feels like, to me, a G, C, and a D. This is what I call the feel of G, because it feels like the key of G. But really, we're in the key of A, okay? Just because it feels like a G doesn't mean it's a G, because we just put that capo up here for the same reason. For the same reason, this is not the, the key of G. And each time we're playing the same chord forms, but we're changing the key because of that capo, okay? So now inside the course, I also have a matrix for you that'll tell you, okay, if you have the capo on the second fret and you're playing a G, C, D, you're in the key of blank. I have a beautiful color matrix that I made specifically for you. It's in that free course for you Do that. Go get it. Okay, now, um, yeah, I didn't say that I would talk about this, but I will real quick. So when you're using capos, just a real quick thing here, all different types of capos, fancy ones, cheap ones, adjustable ones, clip-on ones. These clip-on ones seem to work best for like singer-songwriter acoustic players because they take them and they just do this and you're playing and you're doing your song and then you need the capo and you just do this. Most electric guitar players don't want a capo hanging off. It looks goofy. Songwriters don't care. Also, um, an adjustable capo is really helpful with the electric guitar, and here's why. Acoustic guitars and the strings that they use are typically pretty hardy. So when you put a capo like this on, that's a clamp, it's spring-loaded and it's pretty heavily loaded so that it works every single time. Well, what that does is it presses the strings down and can put the guitar out of tune. Usually not a problem with the acoustic guitar, but with the electric guitar, it is a little bit more of a problem. So we want to use uh, a nice adjustable capo. And what I mean by adjustable is you've got like some sort of little pin or something that you can adjust the tension on it that will allow the guitar to breathe a little bit more. I, I should say it allows it to 
to not be so stuck. Okay, so I just need to get that buzz out. So now, what I did is I just adjusted it. You snap it on, adjust, and, uh, or adjust, snap it on, and then you have just the right amount of pressure, so now, it's not putting the guitar out of tune like the other one was. Listen, listen to this. Can you hear that going out of tune? Right, because I'm actually pressing the, the capo down and that's what these do. So get yourself, if you're playing um, electric and you've got a capo or you want a capo, get a nice adjustable one. This is a Shub, S-H-U-B-B. -B. You can probably find that in my store. In fact, I know you can find that in my store. Um, is this still Kit? Your Kit.com slash your guitar stage? I'll put it in there. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Mike. Mike will put it in. We'll put that in the the um, the chat. But a place you can get capos and all the the gear I suggest. Okay, cool. All right. Chord transitions, inventory trick. Let's talk about that real quick. So now when when folks are transitioning from one chord to another, this is you know, there are certain, uh, what do I call them, like obstacles or challenges or um, gauntlets that one needs to push through, accomplish, in order to feel that momentum on the guitar. And they're almost always the same for everybody, but when you don't know that that's the case, you might think that you suck as a person or a guitar player or as a person trying to be a guitar player or whatever because you're having a problem with a particular thing but it's usually always the same things you want me to tell you what they are strumming basic fretting fretting in the beginning but strumming um, bar chords finger picking I know there's other stuff but oh transitioning from one chord to the next. So there's all these layers. So you're gonna, you're gonna run into trouble play, troubles playing a chord before you're gonna run into troubles playing a chord transition. Uh, transition. But it's just like when we grow up, right? In kindergarten, uh, writing our name was difficult. Now that's not so difficult anymore. Now we're doing different things that are more difficult, right? So we're graduating constantly, hopefully in life, if we're learning and we're trying to get better and better, we're learning all the time. But if you get in this mentality of like, I suck, anytime you come across a new challenge, well, that's gonna be pretty self-destructive because life is literally made of challenges. It's what makes us great, right? So, um, so that's okay. So get used to them. Um, so with this one, the chord transitions, folks have issues when they're moving from one chord to another. And what I've, what I've told them is this, we, what we want to do is we want to find out what is associated between the two chords that we're going back and forth with. And then we want to create a, uh, a neural path or uh, we want to create a protocol, a system of going from the one chord to the next so that we can go to it every time and we don't have to think about it. It's embedded in our subconscious, okay? So uh, the way that I do this and the way I've taught my students is, uh, is to take the two chords that you're trying to transition back and forth to and find out what's similar about them. So for instance, if we're going from a C to an A minor, Nine, nine out of 10 guitarists will do this. They'll lift their fingers up off that chord and play the next chord. That well, seems logical, we're going from one chord to the next. But is it logical? Nope, it's not. And I'll tell you why, because if we play this C chord, if I think about it a little bit ahead of time, I'll understand that this finger and this finger never need to move. Well, why is that important, Eric? That's not a big deal. Well, sure it is. If it's taking you five seconds to set up the chord, it might have something to do with, with one of the three fingers that you gotta set up now. So if you only have to move one finger, wouldn't it make a lot more sense to take inventory of what it is you have to do and then do that? Do only the things you need to do instead of the, the other things that you don't need to. That's what I call the inventory breakdown method. So you take the C and you have an A minor where you say, well, I don't have to do that because these two fingers stay the same. So here's my A minor. Here's my C chord. So now instead of practicing this, it's gonna take a minute. You do have to kind of embed this into your new, your new protocol, your new way of doing things. 
but you literally just have to move that one finger and then eventually you can get very quick at this, right? Then the thing that you would do is once you've established that that's the only thing that you have to do is move that one finger, then you just kind of sit here, focus on that finger and think about the jump before you get to it. Don't strum or anything, just focus on that left hand because wherever focus goes, energy grows, right? So that will develop, it'll get better. Then what you wanna do is you wanna give it a strum, nice and slow, and I would say one note at a time so you can understand what's happening in that chord. So you wanna strum it nice and slowly and then move to the next chord. You only moved one finger. And you wanna make sure that those chords are nice and clear. Eventually, you will feel that that chord's right. So I can hold this chord right now and know that I will play this chord correctly because I can feel what it feels like. I can tell you that right now, the way this chord feels, I won't play it right, it won't sound right. Because I'm muting certain notes, because I can now feel what it feels like for those notes or for those strings to touch the backs of my fingers. And guitar players, uh, who are really good don't really think about this stuff too much, but it's what they're doing. So we're, we're br just breaking that down. So you, you'll start feeling the chords underneath your, under your fingers, the, the strings underneath your finger, okay? So practice that inventory trick. If it's something like uh, a G to a D, well, you might go, well, I could set this, you know, I don't have to play this G and this D. I could, I could play this G and this D. And now I have an anchor finger. So that guy would stay the same. That's helpful. Much easier than, uh, what was it? Um, easier, right? And quicker. Uh, if, if something's, uh, in the case of like an A minor to an E major, well, it's the same shape, just moved down one string. So that whole thing could move together like a set instead of each finger at a time now we're missing the chord in time. We just move it as a set. And when you start practicing it, again, like this, where you're just doing your thing, not strumming or anything, you're practicing 95% of the stuff you need to practice by just doing this. The strumming part's not really the thing you need to work on, you need to work on this. So if you notice with, with these exercises that I'm giving you, they all, kind of do the same thing. They're hyper-focusing you on the thing. I mean, why do you want to play guitar? Uh, all these things, it's all about hyper-focus because there's 10 million things that could be taking our attention. But when you hyper-focus when you're playing guitar, it means everything. It, it, you're gonna have such amazing progress as opposed to being scattered, okay? Okay, let's talk about the major scale real quick, why it's so important. So the major scale is literally the uh, I, I think I've said that before, maybe even today, it's the ruler for the carpenter, okay? It's the yardstick for the carpenter, it's the, or the hammer. It's the thing they use all the time that everything else is, well, it's probably the, the ruler because we're comparing, we're using it for music theory and what have you. So the major, uh, a scale, first of all, is a, a series of notes, a set of notes that follow a pattern. That's a loose definition, but essentially that's what a scale is. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a set of notes that follows a pattern. And the major scale is no different. It contains seven of the 12 known notes. I say known, there's only 12 notes, right? Uh, at least when we're talking about like Western music, not country and Western, but Western, like out, like almost every part of the world, honestly. Indian music has um, some semitones and stuff that it uses, but not pop rock country, jazz, hip hop, etc. It's all 12 tones. And usually when we're playing those 12 tones, we're only, we're not playing 12 tones, we're playing seven of those notes and it's the major scale. You've heard this before. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. It's a very familiar sound to us because even as an infant in your baby, in your mom's womb, you are hearing music. And you were hearing these, you didn't know what they were, but Half of you don't know what they are now anyhow. It doesn't matter. What matters is you were hearing beautiful music. So it doesn't matter what, what the name that you put on it, a rose by any other uh, name, right? It's still a rose. I think that's how it goes, something like that. Um, so it's still gonna smell the same, the roses, and the, the scale's still gonna be the same. So um, understanding the scale, uh, the sound of that scale has been so built into our DNA over the years that you can't get away from it. 
And so because of that, I mean, you can get away from it, but it's going to sound like you're getting away from it, okay? It's like, it'd be like, people go, man, I want something other than the major scale. Well, sure, there's other stuff. There's modes but that are associated to the major scale. There's the minor scale, which is associated to the major scale. It's just a sub subdivision of it uh, or a, a different way to play it. There's the pentatonic scales, major and minor. Oh, those are subdivisions of the major scale. Um, so, so most scales that you're listening to in pop, rock, blues, country, that sort of thing are derivatives of the major scale. So it all really all comes back to that. Of course, you can go outside of it, but again, that's not the stuff that your mom was listening to when you were a baby. It's not the stuff that was on every single friggin' advertisement growing up. You weren't listening to atonal advertisements, all right? So because of that, the, the major scale is so built into you that this is very, very important because it's literally the structure of all the music that we're going to study. All of it, okay? And we'll see, we'll, we'll, um, we won't go into that. Uh, today we probably won't go into that this week because that's a much longer discussion and I it's covered over dozens and dozens of videos inside of the unstoppable guitar system hundreds in some in some cases okay in different goes down different tributaries but the major scale sounds like this and it has a construction to it this is whole step whole step half whole 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 half if the distance between one fret and the next is a half step two halves make a whole. So if we play a note and then we go up a whole step and we go up a whole step again and then a half, whole, 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 half, we have the major scale. It's the same thing. We're just playing it on one string here, okay? This makes it a little bit more convenient to play riffs. Okay? Now, um, with that being said, the major scale, if you know the major scale, whole step, whole step, half, whole, 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 half, as I teach you inside the program, you can move this and start this from any note on the fretboard, follow that pattern, and you have that exact scale, okay? And then I teach some other forms and what have you later on in the, in the, um, in the course, but understanding the major scale is really good because we use it for all sorts of things. In fact, we may use it on Thursday and Friday as we get into the intermediate and advanced stuff, okay? We may be using that. So we're just remember that major scale. So go over that today. Look, everything that we did yesterday, everything that we did today, you should be going through those things in the course because now is the time to be asking me these questions is this week because I'm in front of you all week. So let's do that. Let me help you out and also, um, it's going to make more sense if we're talking about it the day of and you're going down, going through those lessons, preferably before, if not after, it's going to help, okay? All right, lastly, let's talk about playing by ear and then let's get to some questions. We're almost at the one hour mark. It's perfect timing. So when we're playing by ear, people think, first off, there's some psychology here again. People think that playing by ear, that if you hand the guitar to Jimi Hendrix, that he's just going to be able to play anything that he wants because he's playing by ear. And here's where, yes, he's using his ear. Everybody's using their ear, right? Some are using their ear more than others, but here's where it gets sticky is that, no, in fact, he's using a lot more than his ear. He's using association and his understanding of the guitar neck. Like when I'm teaching you these springboards and what have you, um, it's absolutely has everything to do with memorization of the way the fretboard's laid out. So anybody saying, uh, I only play by ear, it's, it's like, yeah, it's kind of true. It's not totally true because um, anybody who learned any song in the past, they're learning these patterns on the fretboard, right? And if somebody said to me, Eric, I will bust your theory right now. I just play by ear. I'd say, cool, wait. Hold on just one second. And I turn around and I tune the guitar to something that was in tune, but the strings weren't lined up the way they were used to. Because why should they be? If you're playing by ear, you should be able to just go anywhere you want on the neck at any time because it's just playing by ear, right? Or is it? No, you need it to be set up a certain way, meaning there's certain patterns, meaning you're not just playing by ear, you're playing by other, other faculties or other other methods as well, okay? So this is really important because our learning all these different patterns is super duper helpful. However, um, when we combine developing the ear and what we're really developing, we're not really developing the ear. What we're doing is we're developing 
the the we're developing in our minds what it is that we're actually hearing. Okay, so for instance, a child hears a B diminished chord when, when it's an infant. And then when it, after 50 years of conducting the London Symphony Harmonic, whatever, orchestra, that same baby hears a B diminished chord and is like, ah, oh, it's a B diminished chord. Okay, is the chord any different? No, it's the same exact chord, right? A rose by any name. Uh, by any other name, right? Same thing. It's the same. It's the same thing. But what's happening is that is that baby grew up and is now is able to identify what that chord means because of its context to music and and to music theory and everything else. So um, so and understanding that context is everything because the baby heard the same exact chord. Okay. So this is what we're doing when we're when we're playing by ear. What we're doing is we're learning what these different things mean and they'll trigger us to go, oh, that's a minor chord or oh, that's a pentatonic scale, I can hear it. And then all of a sudden you're running with it now as opposed to not having that before, okay? So for instance, one of the ways that I teach, or not for instance, next part of this, playing by ear, one thing that we wanna do is we want to get used to humming a note and then finding it on the instrument. And there's a trick to this, and I go over it in detail inside of the course, but I'm gonna go over it real quick with you. If I go, hmm, that was lucky. I did, that was completely lucky. Relative pitch, but hmm, So right there. How did I find that? Well, I knew it was higher than the note that I that I played before, just because I was kind of thinking about, well, mm, like, you know, you raise your eyebrows, or you can imagine it going up or walking upstairs or something like that. So it's definitely a higher note. So I knew to go up higher in the neck, but how much higher? Well, I was just guessing. I got real close, I got half step away. Now, if I couldn't find it though, what do I do? I move in half steps in the direction that I think it should go. What I mean by half steps is one fret at a time on one particular string. If you're jumping around thinking that that's a faster way, you're fooling yourself and wasting everybody else's time because that's not faster. It's slower. So meth methodically going through the frets, starting off where you think it might be and then moving linearly in half steps up or down one string in the direction that you believe it should go, you find that first note. And then from there, you find the second note and you keep on doing that. Once you find the first note, the other notes in a series are much easier. Da 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 Okay, so once I find the first note, um, I start using patterns that I know on the guitar, that you're learning on the guitar, like the major scale, that sort of thing. And now all of a sudden, you're not just stabbing in the dark here, you're actually, you have some reasons why you might want pick one fret over the other. So that's using the hum and hunt technique. And then you're also gonna learn the major scale. When you know those two things and you start learning these other patterns in that other course I'm giving you today that talks about springboards, um, cage system, and all that good stuff, uh, then all of a sudden you're gonna have a better grasp of the neck and you're developing developing your ear. Those two are awesome for really being able to play stuff very quickly. That's what we mean by playing by ear, by the way. Every guitar player, whether they know it or not, they may not even know it. There's a lot of people, um, I think Dave Grohl says, there's people that say, I don't know music theory. Dave Grohl, I think is one of those who says that. He does know music theory. He knows shit tons of music theory. Um, he just doesn't know that he doesn't know music theory. What's happening is he knows the shapes, okay? And because of those shapes, he may not know what the name is on it. He may not know the name of the scale, but he knows the shapes. He's playing the pentatonic scale. He's playing major chords. He's playing minor chords. If he didn't know music theory, he wouldn't be doing those things. He doesn't have to have the labels for him, but he still knows what he's doing, right? You could have somebody who, I don't know, knows how to, uh, I don't know, do, what's the wiring in the wall. He knows how to do electricity, but didn't get a certi cer certification. Ooh, he didn't have a certification. Okay, but he's been doing it for 50 years. So I'll go with that guy, uh, as opposed to the guy who just graduated from, from school with his degree. So, um, so that stuff's important to, to know, to understand. Uh, don't fear music theory, okay? Because it's absolutely so helpful. Okay, playing by ear, that was it. That was it for today. Okay, good. We're gonna go into some questions now. I really wanna help you guys out. Move the needle forward here 
and get you guys into um, the next level that you that you want to be in. Let me see if I can't find. I had a hip here. There it is. Here it is. Okay, here is the questions. Okay, excellent. I'm gonna look here, friends. If you would, all caps and a question mark would be super helpful. You know. Okay, I really want to help you here. Let's get into it. Okay, um, are you going to teach about intervals? I'm learning that now listening. Tracy, I won't be teaching it this week, but I do teach it in the course, okay? And I teach it in, in different ways. So you're listening to it and then you're seeing it and then we're looking at it on the fretboard and we're seeing it on this, on, um, on, on, on a graph. Um, I, I do go down all that and, and because I find it very helpful because look, later on in the course in the intermediate and advanced sections, we're talking about chord construction. So I show you, okay, this is how you wanna play, you wanna know thousands of chords like that and be able to pull them up anytime you want. Sounds impossible, but it's not because what you do is you learn the formulas of these chords and there's not that many formulas. I mean, yeah, if you get into if you get into like deep jazz and, and trying to e e exhaust every single chord, yeah, there's a few dozen, probably more than a few dozen formulas. Uh, so you'd have to memorize those. But once you do, you're multiplying those times 12 keys, multiplying those times every single fingering iteration and every single in, um, inversion iteration. You're talking thousands of chords, but really only from dozens of formulas, okay? So, um, it's a good thing to know, and, and, and we definitely go down that path inside of the Unstoppable Guitar System because uh, you have to know the intervals if you're going to teach, you know, ninja chord memorizing skills like I teach because we're not really memorizing by rote any more than you're memorizing the... Have you memorized the, the uh, English language? I haven't. I'm learning all the time, I'm, but, but I, I know some stuff and the words just come out automatically. It's pretty cool. Um, so it's important that we know these intervals, right? Um, okay. May you show one or two examples of major blues outside the 12 bar blues framework? Uh, may you show one or two examples? Uh, I probably won't on this today just because I'm not really set up for that, but um, outside of the 12 bar blues. And then also, um, I just don't feel like I'm going to do that justice. Most of my playing is blues playing, rock playing. Yes, I do some major blues, but it's typically in blues. And you're saying outside the 12 bar blues. Well, if you want it to be blues and it's outside the 12 bar blues, it's like you want it to be red, but not so red. You know, we're talking about the color red. Uh, blues is blues. So 12 bar blues, yes, you could... Um, you would have to have some sort of major chord progression, but then it's not gonna sound bluesy anymore if you're trying to stay away from that 12 bar blues. Does that make sense? Um, okay, good. Oh, glad you got that, Sonia, about the capo. If I capo the second fret and I play the A shape, is the chord I play actually a B chord? You got it, Jeff, beautiful. Okay, so uh, syncopate, syncopation is when we're, we're, you know, we emphasize the up beats, right? So um, if we did something like that, where we're emphasizing the up beat sometimes here, I'm syncopating that. I'm also throwing straight beats in there too, but like. So it's on, the, on those up beats, when I'm, when I'm pushing that beat, that's a syncopation. Uh, I heard another player mention the seven feelings. Is he talking about the seven modes? Probably so. That would be my guess. But because I haven't heard that, the seven feelings. But probably so, because modes means moods. And the Greek modes, the Greek moods, is, you know, they were all said to, to evoke different moods in people. So any thoughts on tuners that attach to the headstock of a non-electric acoustic instrument? Rechecking after adding the capo. Yeah, I have a few like that. So I have capos that have little tuners on them, not this one, but you put it on and then you can check your tuning. And uh, yeah, they're helpful. I like them. 
especially for that sort of thing. Oh, I love this. Mark took the 30-day challenge during lockdown in April two years ago. My guitar playing has advanced tenfold. So pay attention. This stuff works. Yeah, I love that, Mark. Thanks so much. Beautiful. Fantastic testimony. I love it. Can you teach a slow learner? Yes. Yeah, yes, absolutely. That's, I mean, look. What is that? Let me, let me ask you this, Timothy, because I bet you it's not even true. You think you're a slow learner. By what metric? What metric do you think you're a slow learner? Because of what? <laughs> it's just like, honestly, everybody's a slow learner in the beginning because you're not moving as fast as you want to be. So you're not a slow learner, Timothy. You're just learning stuff. That's it. And when you're learning stuff in the beginning, it tends to feel slow. So you ain't slow. Okay, there's nothing to quantify that. So the answer is yes, I can teach you. Uh, now, I should say, I have a special place in my heart for beginners. The reason being is because, look, man, when you get two, three years down the line of playing guitar, you have this confidence about you. You don't need to have somebody, you know, helping you with all these little bits and pieces. So that's great. You're on your own, right? So that's why I have a, a special place in my heart for, for beginners is because you're like, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm having a hard time with this. My, my fingers are too small, whatever, 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 down right down the line. And you're like, dude, it's none of those things. Do this. You watch this improve. And then all of a sudden they, they believe it because they're seeing it happen, okay? Is it an electric or acoustic better for a beginner? Uh, I answered this one yesterday. The acoustic is less distraction. The electric is typically easier to play because the strings are typically thinner. Acoustic strings typically thicker, usually higher action, usually a little bit harder to press down on those strings, sometimes a lot harder. So the electric is easier. So if you're having issues with actually fretting and stuff like that, which everybody does in the beginning, but again, it would be easier, most likely, on an electric. But now you got to futz with, uh, you know, knobs and amps and that sort of thing. And if that bothers you, then you know that's gonna that's gonna throw you for a loop. Okay. All right. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have tuners uh, too on that same link that Mike posted earlier. I've got I've got tuners on that on that uh that's in that store. How do you use scales in songs? So Kanal, if you have not gotten in the free course already, you need to because I teach you that I teach you about key, right? The major scale. I showed you that that, that we played a G major scale there, by the way. So the G major scale is the key of G. So if you have chords that are playing in the key of G, as I teach you in that really beautiful color chord matrix that you'll run across in those videos, um, you know, the chords in the key of G major are G major, A minor, B minor, C major, D major, E minor, uh, F sharp diminished. If you play those any combination of those chords, you're gonna be in the key of G major, right? For the most part. Any combination of those, you're going to be in the key of G major, especially if you're including the G in there. And so if you play the G major scale over the top of that, it will it'll work with it. So it's kind of like this. If G major is the topic and the chords are people talking about it and the scale is somebody talking about the same subject, if you put those things together, they're going to sound like they're all talking about the same thing, like they're at a you know, car meetup or something like that. They're all going to be talking about cars. If that guy came, comes along and plays in the key of F while the G chord progression is going on, it's like he showed up at the wrong club. And they're not, no one's going to know. It's going to just be weird. It's going to be awkward. Okay, so the same scale needs to match the, the chord progression or vice versa, but typically we, we think about the chord progression as being the background and the, the scale or the melody being the foreground, the most important thing, the thing that's up front type of thing, you know what I mean? But that's how you use scales and chords together, it has to be in the same key. Um, if it's a major chord progression, you use a, need to use a major scale. If it's a minor chord progression, a minor scale. If it's A minor, use an A minor scale. If it's G major, use a G major scale. If it's G major, you could use the G major pentatonic. 
If it's A minor, you could use the A minor pentatonic, but it would need to be that label first, A minor, G major. Make sense? E-shaped bar chords. I get one clean, then it all falls, falls apart. Can you cover the basics? Mark, I won't in this just because I've created so many videos on this, but Mike, if you find the uh, the video on the effing F chord, and I think I did one that was more recent as well. Uh, I think the F and F chord was you know many years ago, and then I redid one that was a little bit better quality and what have you. But Mark, um, if we can't find that link, if you just search F and F chord, like E or E F F I N G, effing F chord. If you search that on YouTube, you'll find exactly what you're talking about because I'm because it's basically the E shape, right? And I'm and I'm showing you using the F chord, but we break it down into two, three, four, five note uh, passages or sections, and then we slowly build up that chord. Okay, but what you're saying here is taking out a lot of detail. And with that video, I add all the detail and get you exactly where you want to go. So check that one out, Mark. That's that's the panacea for what ails you, friend. Thanks. Yes, that made sense. Just wanted to try out something new, like eight bars with major chords. You could, yeah. I want to play in church. Which course do you recommend? Um, okay, hold on. I just, okay, here we go. I want to play in my church. Which course do you recommend? Marco, first thing I would do is I would get in the courses that I'm giving you today for free, get, a, get an understanding of those. And then uh, I did a worship course with Dave Cleveland. It dropped, I think last month or month, month before that. That's on Udemy. Uh, I'll have Mike put up the link for you. In fact, um, I'll have Mike put up the link to, um, is that, if, if you can do that, Mike, to, to the worship course, um, maybe in our, slash Udemy or Udemy students or whatever uh, link. Uh, but there's a course that I did with Dave Cleveland, who is a master studio guitar player and is, is played with everybody under the sun here in Nashville. And he's also uh, very involved in worship music. And he created he and I created a course together and it is it's super good. So that's the other thing I would go, right? Okay, good. All this encouragement is really great. If you have anything encouraging to say in the chat, you know, your own journey, take a moment if you would and think about it. Some aha moments, either if I've brought you through it or you've got through it yourself or you remember not being able to play the F chord and now you can or not being able to play some sort of bar chord and now you can or, or music theory or playing by ear or something. If you have an encouraging testimony, please put that in the chat so other people can see. Uh, because I think sometimes people don't believe when it's coming from the, uh, a teacher, right? They think, ah, oh, this guy's selling something and he doesn't really, he doesn't understand. He was born that way or whatever. It's like, nope, um, absolutely not. So uh, let them know, but it's going to come better from you than from me, right? Uh, okay, lost the download links. Can you post them? Yeah, they're in the description of the video, my friend. Okay. Okay, Doug is saying Gretsch, Fender, Gibson, PRS, or Epiphone. It just depends on what you're looking for, friend. There's a reason that there's all those guys out there. They're all good in their own respect and it just depends what you're looking for. Let me know what kind of music you play, Doug. What are your favorite Sorry, bands? What do you want to play? Please try again. I'll, I'll tell you what, you, you hush it, Siri. I'm talking to you. Um, you tell me what it is that you're, what kind of music you're into and I'll tell you of those, which, and remind me, uh, copy and paste the Gretsch and all that stuff and then say, this is the music I'm into, and then post that, and then I'll remember you, Doug. Okay. All right, good. Good, good. I get frustrated by alternate tuning. That's just because you don't know it. That's all. It's a different language. It's just you're not immersed in it enough. Once you start immersing yourself in it more and more, it'll start making sense. But what, you know... This is what I've learned, man. And I know I sound like I'm always going off on these rabbit rabbit trails, rabbit holes, whatever, but it's just totally true. When you think that something's going to happen much quicker than it than it does, it's very frustrating. It feels like it's taking forever type of thing, right? 
But if you practice mindfulness and you really take that moment in and you say, man, this alternate tuning is fun. It helps me do this, it helps me do that. And you just start playing the licks and then you kind of graduate into another lick or another trick. And you just kind of take it day by day and really like let each moment mean something to you. The time will slow down. It'll feel much better. I'm learning this uh, with yoga. I've been doing yoga for years and meditation for years. And the way I used to do yoga five years ago, as opposed to 10 years ago, as opposed to, to 20 years ago, it's completely different. There's so many levels. You just keep going deeper and deeper. And um, I remember, you know, doing yoga for the first time and going, this sucks. This is terrible. Why would you do this to yourself? Now I wake up at 5 a.m. every morning and I do it and I love it. It feels great. But that's only because I've done it and you kind of wear off the edges. And the same thing, the reason that you're frustrated, Tim, is that you don't know what it is that you want to know. You don't want to, you can't make the sounds that you want to make right now. And that's okay. That's everybody, right? So really enjoy the bits that you can do right now. Learn more, take your time, but you're going to be frustrated until you're not it's just, you know, I know that's not rocket science, but it's just true. I was told that we had to retune after putting on a capo. Is that correct? And if so, how to do it? So you would tune it just normal, like you would, you know, you're just, whatever the notes are, uh, moved up the neck, obviously wherever you're at in the capo is going to change all the notes. So you would need to tune, but you could use your ear usually because you're, it's only going to be off a little bit. However, if you use an adjustable capo on an electric, you probably won't have those issues, or if you do, they're going to be very slight, and you'll know which direction you should tune the note to. Uh, however, these clamp clamps work well on the acoustic guitars, and don't put them out of um, they don't put them out of pitch too much, you know. David Davy C saying UGS Pro three years ago now, best investment ever. Started high st started guitar in high school 58 years ago, then played bass for 30 years. Now back to guitar. Thanks, Eric. Love that, Dave. Davey, thank you so much, bud. Awesome. Oh, Mike posted that on the F chord and then the Udemy course. Beautiful. Yeah, follow those links, friends. That will help you a ton. The effing F chord lesson was awesome, TC said. G beautiful. Do I still have the Gutulele? I do. They still have the same strings on them. Uh, do they make them with steel strings? I want one. It looks badass. They don't make one with steel strings. They don't. They have mini guitars, though. I have mini guitars, like the, like, I think it's called the Baby Taylor, or the BT-1. I think it's called the BT-1. It's a small guitar like that. Not quite as small, but it's pretty small. Okay, theory lessons, plural, that is. Okay. I fitted locking tuners on my acoustic and electrics and find very stable tunings, and it seems to solve capo tuning issues as well. Okay, locking tuners on my acoustics and electrics, huh? That's interesting. I've never heard someone putting locking tuners on the acoustic. I, I, how do you tune it? Does it have tuners down here? Um, that's interesting. I need to download the links. I need, I need the download links. They're in the description of the video, my friend. The download links are in the description of the video. That's where you're going to get all that good stuff. They're looking for the PDF. They they're, need to get in the course to get them. They're looking for the what? The PDFs. Huh. They need to get in the course. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you download. Yeah, you get in there. You get in the five-day course that's in the link, uh, that's in the link of the description. That's it's in the description of the video. You hit that link. It'll take you to the page. You're gonna scroll down to the bottom. That's how you're gonna get into those two courses. Once you're in the courses, you're gonna have access to everything. Obviously, um, I can't hand them to you. I have to do it through the interwebs. So you're gonna have to get those courses, but they're free. Okay, could you please suggest what strings would sound best for all mahogany guitars? There is no string that sounds best for all. That's the truth of it. There is none. It's what sounds best to you. And I wouldn't know that. You would have to tell me what sounds best to you. 
Could you give a good place? Now, that being said, there may be some of that could, that, that could give an opinion on that, but that's all it is, is an opinion. They might say, well, mahogany is a dark wood, and, and I don't know. I don't know what the, the sound of mahogany makes. Uh, some of my buddies who are really into that probably would. I don't go, I don't go down that far. Um, I say, this guitar sounds great. Uh, just do make give me another one, or I'll buy another one like that. I don't have the time for the details. It just doesn't interest me. So, but somebody who's really interested in that, like like Greg Ellis, my guitar tech, he might say, "Oh, mahogany is a dark, darker sounding uh, tone, and so you might want to use brighter strings on it or something like that." But um, I couldn't tell you that. Could you give a good place to get guitar tab charts for guitar songs? Yes. Uh, Ultimate-guitar.com is where most people go for tabs. I really personally do not like the website so much. Well, I think they're, I don't know. I don't like that, them so much, but they got tabs. Uh, Franz is saying, testimony, this guy is selling something and you should buy it ASAP if you want to learn how to play the guitar. Very legit, credible, motivational, and sincere human helping others. That's really kind, Franz. Thank you, buddy. Uh, Brill Cream or Dippity Do? Uh, Brill Cream, of course. The classic. Um, but my dream guitar is to learn... Oops, hold on, that went away. But my dream guitar and to learn a Floyd Rose system with a locking tuners is a Wolfgang or an Ibanez. Ooh, yeah. What is the difference between the 2-2 and the 4-4? Four, four? It seems like the math comes out the same. Yeah, it does, uh, Stivosaurus. But typically, you know, when we're talking about a song that's in 2 or a song that's in 4, is it's usually the emphasis. So a song that's like a... One, two, 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 right, like some country and western might be in 2. Uh, it's going to have that vibe to it as opposed to one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, the, feel, the, the count is the same, but the feel's not. Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, 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 two. Yeah, there's a different feel to it, right? Okay. Decoding packets. Thank you so much. I keep going for my scroller over here, and I got it in my hand today. Uh, oh, beautiful. Love that. Oh, good. Decoding packets. Uh, beautiful. I can finally play two things I wanted to play. Mud on the Tires with the intro, November Rain, all the solos at tempo. He is amazing. Oh, thank you, bud. Appreciate that. Practice, practice, practice. Indeed. Um, and constantly make such huge gains. So somebody said this. If you... Uh, God, I forgot what the statistic is, but... Hmm. Basically, um, I, I won't even get into it because I'll slaughter it because I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. But they were talking about increasing, getting better 1% per day, which is just a small amount, right? Um, but accum that accumulative effect has massive power. Massive power. Uh, Tony Robbins always says most humans uh, overestimate what they can do in a few days and underestimate what they can do in a few years or something like that. It's something along those lines. Because compounding, doing a particular thing over and over again is a big deal. If I jump on the trampoline 3,000 jumps every day on, uh, you know, in the morning, well, after a year times 365, that's over a million jumps on a trampoline, right? That's huge. It has that, it's about that accumulative effect. So absolutely practicing and continually, consistently practicing creates huge gains. Same thing with working out, same thing with eating right, all those things, right? Have you ever been or would like to go to a guitar factory? I'd love to go to Les Paul and, yeah, in Gibson. Yeah, Gibson's actually right down the road here. And um, yeah, it's pretty cool to see. I have been in, in, um, in facilities. I hadn't been in Gibson, but I've been in facilities where they make guitars and what have you, and it's pretty fascinating to see all the guitars in the different um, stages of development. It's pretty pretty cool, you know. Would you agree that a, that the guitar neck is harder to learn than the piano keyboard? Yeah, I mean, I don't like to ever say stuff like that because to me, um, it just creates, can create excuses, but absolutely. I mean, my my 
he's six now, but when he was, you know, four or five, he's, he goes up to the piano and he played the piano for like an hour every day. He's just tweaking out, you know, playing stuff, hitting a couple notes and what have you. But he's not going to be able to do that on the guitar. He, he runs from the guitar because it's, uh, he's like, I don't know what to do with that thing, right? The piano, you can go up, you can play chords and scales the very first day by just pressing down. So absolutely, the piano keyboard is more approachable than a guitar neck. Uh, and the guitar neck is maybe a little bit more approachable than say like a violin. So yeah, there's definitely some, some layers to this, I'd say. Can you tell me the difference between blues and jazz in your opinion? Um, well, jazz is arguably more complex. It uses more variations of chords, more types of chords. Blues is tip typically just seventh chords. Uh, you can get into jazz blues, but now we're getting into jazz. So blues is typically seventh chords, sometimes just major chords, sometimes minor chords, and um, it typically uses the pentatonic scale or the blues scale, which is very similar, only one note away from each other, whereas jazz uses uh, chromaticism and uses diminished in whole notes, a whole tone scales and diminished scales and uh, all the different modes and what have you. So it's definitely uh, arguably more complex. Uh, chord progressions are more complex typically too. Yeah. Okay. I learned so much you the last two years since the lockdown with your course, but the theory I'm finally getting it. It takes a lot of practice. Thanks for all you do. You're so welcome, Marine Mama. That's awesome. Love it. Ah, uh, Lori, thank you. I've learned so much already through the pro membership. My favorite thing to do still is to run through your strumming level sheets. So much fun. Good. I'm so glad that you guys returned back to these things because really uh, it, it's all about reiterating those things, uh, especially those fundamentals, these courses that I give you guys. It's, it has everything to do with that, okay? So we're going to be going about another half hour. I'm going, to, I'm going to stick with you in any questions that you have. I'm here for you. I want to see your success. If you're just joining us right now, friends, you click on the link that's in the description of the video. It'll give you, uh, it'll bring you to a page. You'll scroll down to the bottom of that page after you click the link, and there'll be a place where you can get, download the two courses that I have. Just look out for it. You got to use your eyes, but you'll find it, okay? What do you recommend for fretboard care, fast fret or lemon oil? Um... You know, if it's an exposed neck, um, I don't think fast fret is made for that, but I don't know. I don't use anything like that. I used to use lemon oil. I've, I've been told that it will dry out fretboards, but I have the same bottle from 1983 that I bought at Smith Brothers Music in Maryland, Island, Florida back in the day. I still have that bottle. I think, I think, I think I've used uh, maybe a quarter of it. So if you need some, I got some. But uh, fast fret, I don't think that's for the fretboard. I think that's for, for your strings, I'm pretty sure. Um, there's something called Guitar Honey, and it's like in a red bottle. And Greg Ellis, my guitar tech, says that's a really good one. He says it's, it's good for the neck. So check that out, okay? Oh, beautiful, Hal. Uh, sounded bluesy now due to the Sages Master of the Blues course. It works if you work at it. Yep. Won't sound bluesy if you don't. Yep. Exactly right. I was considering getting a guitar with active pickups. Advantages? Disadvantages. Tim, I would say get that if the bands that you listen to are using active pickups. So if you're into, um, you know, a lot of prog rock and um, detuned you know, uh, B tuned guitars, C tuned guitars, where they're, where they're dropping them a whole step, two whole steps, three whole steps, and they have those real thick strings. A lot of those guys use active pickups, EMG. So if you like that sound, or if you like the sound of Zach Wilde or other people that use active pickups, then great. But I know what you're asking him here, Tim, because this seems to be a thing that like kind of techie guys ask or um, kind of left brain guys ask, I've asked it before, there's this thought that, oh, well, since it has a little preamp in it, it's going to be a better sounding pickup. And it's not better sounding, it's just different sounding. Um, the guys that like active pickups will say it's better sounding. And the guys that don't like active pickups will say it's not better sounding, it's worse sounding. So it just depends on what the sound is that you like. 
Um, but I guess the disadvantage to active pickups uh, might, might have something to do with batteries. I don't know. Uh, I don't particularly love the sound of active pickups, but that's maybe just my exposure to them. I, I kind of like the sound of that old, just that old sound. Um, I like, I like, I like pickups that aren't potted as well for certain, for certain applications, right? And other applications, I like them, but when you pot a pickup, which is when they dip them into wax, what it does is it seals, it, it, it you know, it keeps all of those windings from, from breaking and that sort of thing. It just keeps it more secure, keeps them from, sh from, from uh, shaking, keeps microphone. The main thing is it keeps microphonic harmonics from sounding from the guitar and microphonic harmonics uh, create the sound of your tone. So if you like that tone and you wax it, you know, you, you pot them, then you won't get that same sound, right? How to learn to play lead guitar. Start this course, friend. That's a real general question. How do you learn? How do I learn to play lead guitar is you learn. I mean, like, sorry, I, that, you're going to have to get more detailed with that question because that doesn't, I need something to hang on there. You know what I mean? Um, you have to start at the beginning. No one gets to jump to lead guitar. It's like learning to ride a motorcycle before you learn to ride a bike. You got to learn to ride a bike first and before that a, um, um, tricycle before that, right? You know, so Dan is saying signed up for you to me, can't access the course anymore. Uh, Dan, you have to, that is through you to me. So you have to, you have to get in contact with you to me. Uh, our wares, some of our courses are up on you to me, but if you can't sign in, that is like, we don't have access to your email. We don't have access to anything about that. Uh, so I, I wish I could help you, Dan. I'm so sorry. I cannot, but I have no access. It's not my, it's not my website. You know what I'm saying? It's Udemy. So you'd have to get in touch with Udemy. Um, but, um, get in touch with Udemy. They're going to, they're going to help you, but you should have lifetime access. All Udemy courses are lifetime access. Okay. Oh, Drew, that's kind. Eric is a person of many colors and abilities. His classes are fantastic, and he brings in other professional musicians to help with the UGS members. Thank you so much. Love that. Okay. Uh, so a great thing you taught me was to build the chords in your head before you ever move your fingers. Beautiful, uh, Elizabeth. That's great. That's using the inventory method that we're talking about, kind of. Um, it's kind of... I mean, it is. It's all part of that mindfulness of, hey, what is it that we need to do? Okay, well, in this case, we just need to move that one finger. And so you're thinking about it ahead of time, and then you're moving your finger. That's what Elizabeth's talking about. And yeah, super helpful. I talk about it. If you're, if you're trying to jump rocks back home in Cocoa Beach, where I'm from, we had these jetties. And they were these ginormous rocks that weighed thousands of pounds per rock. And there were thousands of these rocks. And they went out, you know, I don't know hundreds of yards out into the ocean. And so you would get your fishing rod or just, you just want to, to go view the sea turtles and stuff. You'd walk out on all these rocks. Well, when I was jumping on these rocks, I would be on one rock and I would figure out where the next rock is and can I get to it and is it wet, is it slimy? Nope, none of those. Okay, I can jump to it. Boom, you jump to the rock. So in that same concept, when you're playing a chord and you're going from one chord to the next chord, you have to develop the protocol of thinking of the things that have to happen before you get to the chord. If you do that, it's going to make moving to that chord so much more, so much quicker. Okay. You might cut the time in a fourth because it has to do with the, the, the mental, the thinking. And so it's kind of like you're, you're doing the work ahead of time before you get to the chord. Then when you get to the chord, the only thing you have to do is execute it, is make the move, but it's not like you start thinking, when it's time to move the cord, just that cord's gonna be gone by then, okay? What thickness pick would you recommend for alternate picking? Here I am, keep reaching over here. I'm gonna put it over here now. Um, what thickness would you recommend for alternate picking? I love that .88, but again, it doesn't matter what I think. That may not work so well for you. So find out what the thickness is for you. I, I emphasize that, overemphasize that, because it's so true. I don't want you to think that .88 is the right pick. It's not. 
It's what I like right now. That's it. That's the only thing. That's the only endorsement it gets. It's what I like right now. May not be what's best for you. Love the strum pattern PDF. I use it all the time. Beautiful. All right, Timothy's got it here. Okay, see you, buddy. Just got the worship course, Donna. Beautiful. Use fretboard 65 oil. Fretboard 65 oil. Hmm. Cool. Kunal, which one is the, the Gibson acoustic guitar you use in many of the other videos? It's, it's brilliant. Oh, thank you, Kunal. Uh, it's, a, it's an SJ200. They call it the king of the flat tops. It's a, it's a big boy. Isn't that what they call it? King of the flat tops? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Quick question. Um, hold on. Oh, good. Carol Kay is beautiful. After playing about one and a half years, going back 30 day challenge from April 2020, the songs you've been teaching, great fun and learning so much. Yeah. Okay. Kill Roy is saying, quick question. Should an open A be played using finger, using three fingering or barred? There is no right way. Uh, it, it depends on what you want to do, you know? Like, I would play it like that if I was playing like cowboy stuff, you know? I would play it like that, but if I wanted to do some, um, you know, if I wanted to do that sort of thing, where I'm actually kind of noodling the chords a little bit, where'd my pick go? Is it still my pick mic? All right, lucky. <laughs> so if I wanted to, you know, here I'm just on the, on strings two, three, four, five, I might bar it so that I can, Does that make sense? So, it, you know, it just depends. I would, I would do both. There's no right way. The, the quicker that you can get right, wrong, best, worst out of your vocabulary when you're playing guitar, the better you will be. I know that sounds kind of weird, but if you, if you stop asking those questions, nothing wrong with saying that, but I'm just saying if you understand that there is no best, I'm trying to help you guys. There's no best. There's what's best for you or in a particular situation or whatever. Uh, so, and it also will liberate you from having to, to, to think stifled and you'll be able to go, hey man, this works great for me. And, and boom, see um, Jack White. That guy makes his own rules when he plays. It's beautiful. I love it. Uh, are you playing an SJ200 or a 185 Gibson? I'm, an SJ200 is what I, what I play often. But I have other guitars, obviously. Oh, thank you so much, Sonia. Very kind. Steven is saying, uh, can you learn to play lead by ear as well as technically knowing theory and notes up the fretboard? Thanks, boss. Love your support. Yes, absolutely, Steven, you can. But again, when we're really talking about playing by ear, you're also basing it off of technical knowing theory. You're basing it off of how the, how the fretboard's laid out. You definitely are because if I went and tuned your guitar a different way, got the same ear, same song, you're not going to be able to play it. So you're technically using music theory. You're using patterns. You're expecting the notes to be under those fingers that you expected to be. So yeah, you're using all those other stuff. You're always going to be using those other stuff. But you can develop the ear, which is really developing your mind to be able to hear that when you hear something, you can identify it through many different methods. Uh, but that's what we mean by playing by ear, you know? Okay, we've got about 45 minutes. All right, we got about 15 minutes, friends. Fretboard doctor, Jeff is saying. Okay, cool. We'll have to check that out. Should A major shape chord be played with three fingers or one finger apart from the bar? Uh, yeah, same thing. It can be done either way. Just depends on what you're wanting to get out of the, out of the song. You know what I mean? Um, God, what was I playing the other day? That, oh, I know what it was. Um... it right uh, Jack and Diane I was I was listening to that song the other day I've never actually sat down and played that song and I was like 
because I could hear it, right? So what happens after a while of playing is you, you start automatically just grabbing what you think it is, not even really thinking too much, like you would just talking, somebody asks you a question, and then boom, there it is, and you're like, oh, there it is, that's nice. And you just start, it starts becoming, it's just like a language, I mean, if you have a first language and a second language, you're at an advantage because you'll, you, you know the difference of knowing your first language and then you can see the struggles of the second language, but the more you do it, the more familiar you'll be with it, right? There's some people who their first language turns into their second language because they've been speaking uh, their second language so, so much longer right now that they move maybe to the States or move to whatever the second language country is. Okay, using a tuner. Uh, whoops. Uh, using a tuner. How important is it to get the pointer exactly in the middle and changing to blue? I keep trying and get close, but not right on. Um, so it depends because, you know, usually I get it in, in the ballpark there. I mean, I'm always trying to hit it dead center, but it just depends if I'm, if I'm in the middle of the song on stage and I have one measure or uh, two measures to, to, to tune a particular string, I'm gonna to have to go for it and it needs to be in the basic area and then I need to turn off the tuner and get to playing my part. So it just really truly depends, but, um, but listen to the, if you're playing your chords and it sounds fine, then you're probably pretty good. Again, if it sounds good, it's probably good. Uh, should I learn more scales to play lead? I know how to play chords. Do you have a course to teach how to play lead over chords? I do. Like everything I teach in the course, it's all part and parcel, right? So you can't be learning theory without learning how to use scales over chords. You just can't because it's all part and parcel. But absolutely, uh, I've got lots of stuff on lead, double stops, scales, et cetera, et cetera. But Felix, this is the deal. People uh, think oftentimes that they need to learn more scales. 99.99% of the time slash that, say 100% of the time, it has nothing to do with more scales. It has to do with your being able to speak the words intelligently or speak the, the notes that you have already intelligently, right? I hadn't said any $5 words, which nowadays $5 words don't, $5 isn't anything. <laughs> but I haven't said any $5 words. Isn't that what they say? $5 words? Seems so cheap right now. It needs to be in, in, adjusted for inflation, absolutely. So, um, you know, I haven't said anything, any, any words that, during this whole two hours here that, were, that any of you missed, I doubt it, unless it was like a musical term. So that would be the equivalent of using the pentatonic scale or the major scale, right? I'm, I'm just using words that we all use every day. I try to teach in that way. I try to teach very simply to get the point across, not to seem like not to make someone feel bad because I know a word they don't. What a ridiculous thing to do. So I tried to keep it at a level where everybody can understand it. And the same thing is true when it comes to playing the pentatonic scale or the major scale. It's not like some other scale is gonna give you some magic all of a sudden. 99.9% .9 of everything that you're hearing is a derivative of the major scale. It's pentatonic, it's major pentatonic, it's minor pentatonic, it's major scale, it's minor scale, it's the Greek modes all based off of the major scale. They're all, they all come from that. I could show you, and I do inside the course, okay? So, um, so yes, Felix, I got you covered there. What are the advantages of a short neck on a beginner electric looking at the Squire Mustang? Well, the advantages is you don't have to reach as far over here. So, you know, the disadvantages are when you get further up the neck, the, you know, the fret distance is gonna be shorter. When you have a shorter neck, the, the fret distance is shorter, but uh, may or may not bother you, you know what I mean? Are you using the Black Star amp behind you today? Davey, no, I'm not, but it's, I've owned many amps over, over the millennia, over, over many decades now. It's my favorite rock and roll amp. I just have never heard anything better than it. You know, and again, other people won't like that amp. So it really has to do with what do you like? That's the sound that I like. It's the sound I grew up with, and so I, I love it, you know? Man, thank you, Brad. I need to bring out my Les Paul. I mean, dear Lord, give some info on your flame top Les Paul. The flames are so tight. Yeah, thank you so much. I, you know, I at least took this one out today. I'm gonna start bringing more guitars out because they're sitting lonely right now. Uh, I tend to 
to be a creature of habit a little bit sometimes. So yeah, so let me tell you about that, that Les Paul. That Les Paul, um, Greg Ellis, my guitar tech, helped me pick out and I said, buddy, I wanna buy uh, a great Les Paul. Would you help me? And, and the reason I bring Greg along is he is just an expert at guitars. So like, I play guitars. It'd be like a race car driver. You may, you probably don't, race car drivers don't know everything about the race car, but the mechanic's gonna know everything about that race car. So you might bring him along to look at race cars, right? So for me, I bring Greg along when I go look at guitars and he helps me, okay, well this year, this is what they did to change this. And the, the pot on this has this kind of, uh, you know, capacitor and so you want to change it out with this bumblebee and then this that and the other thing and so then you're going to get the sound you want so he teaches me all that stuff anyhow we had gone to guitar center long story um i i'll make it short i bought several guitars several several vintage guitars from guitar center i bought two 1967s i bought a 67 strat and a 67 telly they were both butterscotch and i thought well that's kind of cool i got the pair and, uh, and we brought them home and we took them apart and they were anything but 1967. They were 1968, they were 1971, 19, they were all over the place. So they were pieced together and uh, Guitar Center LA said, oh yeah, that's a 67. And I bought it as a 67. I bought 67 prices, but I got a hodgepodge. So um, that's why I bring Greg Ellis because he's literally saved me thousands of dollars before in that sort of occasion. And this particular occasion we went in, I was looking for a Les Paul. This beautiful one jumped out, that one with the flame on it. Someone had already relicked it, so they, and they did a fantastic job. In fact, Greg was like, this looks like a Tom Murphy. Surely it's a Tom Murphy, because it was done so well that this guy uh, did such an amazing job with it. And then he took out the pickups, and he put in some Tim White pickups. Uh, Tim White is known, as you can see in the chat here, Scott and, Scott and Tim are talking about uh, PAFs, patent applied for pickups, which are made by Gibson. They were like the the original in the uh, in the Les Pauls, and they're the sound that our ears are so used to, and the kind of the quintessential perfect sound that everybody goes for, that many people go for, especially when it comes to Les Pauls. There's a guy named Tim White who is said to make the best modern day PAF. So he's taken them and he's and he's hacked them and he's figured out how many wines they put on it and how thick that wire is and what direction and this, that, and the other thing. And he found out all that stuff, got the old bobbins, got the old wires, does just gets all that stuff, that old stuff, and then puts them together as if it was 1957 and they're creating these pickups. So that guitar came with two of those pickups in it. That pickup sets $1,000. If you can wait a year, which I don't even know if the guy makes them anymore, but you were on a waiting list for like a year and you'd pay $1,000 for a set of pickups. Those two pickups were in that, that guitar. So we're starting off with this beautiful, uh, uh, this beautiful Les Paul reissue, uh, 59 reissue, and the flame is amazing. And so you're talking about like right out of the gate back then, you're talking like, $2,500, $3,000 guitar, right? This guy relicked it and made it look even cooler because he did it well. And then they these $1,000 pickups, well, in the same way that Guitar Center, and I love Guitar Center. I use them quite a bit, actually. I use them for, for a lot of giveaways and all sorts of things. So I love the guys at Guitar Center. But this, they, they didn't know what they had with this guitar and they were selling it for like 2,200 bucks or something crazy like that. So I immediately bought it brought it home, found out that it had those pickups in it. So that was a thousand dollar upgrade. I was buying it without knowing that. And uh, Tim was, or uh, Greg was like, dude, you bought, like, you just got such a great deal on this. And uh, I love that guitar. One of my, one of my favorite, love it. Suggestion for an amp for an acoustic guitar, home office playing. Depends on what you want to pay, Franz, but if you're wanting to pay, uh, if you're okay with paying, you know, up you know, upwards of like a thousand bucks, the Da Capo uh, that you see Joe Robinson endorse and play all the time. That one's awesome. I, th I think it's called the Da Capo. Do you remember? Yeah, it's made by Udo. If you search acoustic amp, Capo, C-A-P-O, or Capo, however you want to say it, um, Udo, if you search that, you'll find the amp I'm talking about. Joe Robinson, if you search Joe Robinson, you'll find him talking about the amp he's got uh, 
he really breaks that one down and it's awesome. Uh, that's if you're okay with that um, expensive, kind of more expensive, but insane sound. It's so good. Uh, my band members have, they have two of them and they are amazing. Both nylon string guitars and they're amazing. So there's that. Um, if you want a more affordable version, I would say get a Yamaha uh, THR15, I think it is, THR, something like that. There's a series that they have that are like these little lunchbox dealios. They're longer, they're longer than a lunchbox. You'd, they'd be like a lunchbox for a $5 foot long. But um, yeah, that's if you want to not pay as much money, okay? Cool. Chuck and Dan, next YouTube lesson. Yeah, it needs to be. Why do guitars go out of tune so quickly? Does temperature, etc., play a part? Yes, that and humidity. Eric, how do you sing and play at the same time? Eric, I'd like to go over that, but that's, that is for another day, another lesson. That one's going to take too long. I have a video for you on that, though, Eric. On YouTube, search, sing, uh, search your guitar stage singing and playing, okay? I have the medicine for what ails you. I have a whole course for that inside of UGS. You can get in there for a dollar today if you want. YourGuitarStage.com slash one to get in there and get every single lesson I've been talking about. Okay. Suggestions for websites to how to, to, to find songs to play. Uh, Ultimate-Guitar.com. Five words are a gallon, I guess, I know. Yep. Yeah, I love that one by Mark Twain. That's a great one, yeah. How many gar guitars do I have in total? I'm up to five right now. I don't know, maybe 30. I don't count really anymore because I, I kind of go through stages where I sell some, uh, but I, I'm keeping all my vintage ones and any other instruments that I really am in love with. I got other uh, guitars like this one. It's not vintage, but it's I love the guitar. It doesn't need to be vintage, but I tend to, to lean towards the vintage ones a little bit more. I don't know, could be psychosomatic or... or I don't know. I just love them. I love the way they sound. <laughs> How to get a strumming pattern for any song. Okay, that's great. Let's do that one. That'll be one of our last ones. We got about four minutes here, my friends. Uh, before I answer that one, if you have not already, get the two free courses by hitting the link in the description of this video. It'll take you to a page that you'll see all the deals that we have right now and all the, the five videos that we're gonna be doing this week, okay? So we did one yesterday, we did one today, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all of those you'll, you're gonna find on that page with a description of what it is that we're gonna be talking about and then also all the amazing deals that we have that are ending this Sunday. They're going away, everything's going back up in price. So if you're serious about guitar, Take this time, take, uh, take a look at those deals that we have. Uh, if you want to try things out, you can try the whole enchilada out for $1, yourguitarstage.com slash one. Uh, but don't forget, because the deals are going to end on Sunday, we inevitably always have a bunch of people that are like, I really want to get into the program. Sorry, I missed it. And I'm like, sorry, you missed it. I can't, I can't, I don't have the time to be keeping up with folks if they don't act on those things. You know what I mean? I wish I could, but I, my life is way too busy to do that, okay? Um, and, then, and then so I talk about that, how to, how to find a strumming pattern for a song. I think I may even have a YouTube video for that, but here's the deal. When a song is, you know, it, when it's hitting like this on the hi-hat, you know, you could do a strum that's gonna match that because technically when we're when playing a strumming rhythm, we're... we're we're basically interpreting the drums more than probably anything else. But there's this basic beat, this basic cadence of the beat that goes a certain way that we're trying to replicate on the guitar so that when we play Jack and Diane or whatever song that we're playing, we got the chords there, but those chords have been used a million times. So what else could we use? Well, we could use rhythm to say, hey, this is the song we're at. We're playing, guys. And everybody's like, oh, okay, I know what the song is, right? Using those uh, rhythmic motifs. So... And um, so when, when a song is like, tut, 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 then, you can, then you know that you're gonna be doing some version of this. If it swings, well, now we know that the strumming rhythm swings. Long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long. Instead of even, then we would know it swings, right? If there's an emphasis, 
Well, I can tell you that 75% of the songs out there are this strumming rhythm. One, two, and, and four, and one, two, and, and four, and. That is the very last strumming rhythm in level five of the strumming video that I'm giving to you for free today if you click on that link and you get the course. That's one that I'm telling you is the one that you're gonna use the most, 75% of the time. But there's also little things you'd listen to too. So the snare, so if the snare is like, if it snares like, um, this is just two and four. One, two, three, four. So in that case, I might go like one, two, three, four, right? So then my hi-hat is, Right, it's the same tempo, but my snares, two, three, four. It's on, and emphasizing on two and four. One, two, three, four. And my strumming rhythm is gonna be like one, two, three, four, one, two. So my two and a four, I'm hitting harder, right? So you're gonna listen to the snare drum is two, two, and you're gonna hit that snare drum harder uh, in that strumming rhythm uh, where you hear it. Cool, make sense? Good, all right. All right, real quick. Um, Okay, Samuel, um, you can do you can do either, uh, Samuel. But I would say, I mean, I would say check out UGS honestly, so you can see the difference between the two as well. Okay, uh, Dan, thank you so much for the kind words. Ron, thank you so much. Good. Ah, oh, beautiful, Donna. Beautiful. Love that. Thank you so much. Super kind words, Erie, buddy. Friends, thank you so much for coming out today. I really appreciate it. This was day two of the five-day boot camp, so tomorrow, day three. This is what we're talking about tomorrow, so do your homework for tonight, please. I want to help you through this, and, you know, I always joke about my algebra class. The reason that I took algebra five times in college is because I loved it. Now, it's because I failed it four times, and I uh, passed it. Barely passed it the fifth time. But what, you know, I hated the subject. I hated it. So what would happen is I'd skip a class or I wouldn't do my homework one night. And in algebra, you, at least for me, I couldn't do that because every concept was built upon the next. And it's the same thing with guitar. So if you um, don't do the homework, it's going to put you behind. Don't do it, man. Come on, join me, okay? Get in there. Um, tomorrow, we're gonna be talking about the introduction to the 365 guitar plan. You don't have to have the guitar plan because I'm literally giving you the seven exercises that are in that along with the free course that I'm giving you, okay? So not only do you get, so actually, I'm, I'm a liar. You get seven more, so you get nearly 50 videos for free today, okay? When you click on that link, you get Unstoppable Guitar System Standard. You get the new course I'm just giving you, which is like six videos, and then you get the first uh, seven lessons in 365. So you get a basic idea of what's going on there, and those are the ones that we're gonna be talking about tomorrow. Also gonna talk to you guys about how to navigate that. We're gonna talk about how to read tablature. I'm gonna go over seven exercises, seven core areas of focus that we need to know as guitar players. Things like economy picking, polyphonic uh, playing, uh, finger picking, alternate picking, hammer-ons and pull-offs, that sort of thing, okay? We're gonna go over seven of those with you. They are the seven most, um, I, I should say, the seven kind of core areas of playing as, as a player, the seven areas that uh, that you need to do. You could, you could run with these seven lessons the rest of your life and really do some really cool stuff with them because I'm giving you like, giving you the really good stuff, okay? Introduction to finger picking, we'll be talking that, finger style tomorrow, and then we're gonna be talking about practice makes permanent and what that means. Not practice makes perfect, practice makes permanent. And it's really important to psychologically understand this concept, I'm gonna guide you through it. Uh, slow it down, break it down, which is another concept which helps um, with this practice makes permanent, okay? All right, friends, that is it. Love you guys so much. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thanks for playing. And we'll see you guys tomorrow at noon. Click on that link. I'll see you.